is a little bit difficult to uh, to go back and to say, well, the story is not exactly so. We have the phenomena from all places, from the bottom of the sea with ash and with nickel, which is of meteoric origin. The terrestrial axis moved. And that pale paleomagnetism proves us that terrestrial axis, that magnetic axis, and possibly like Ankan and other of Manchester claim that it, the Earth turned over. We know now from observation of Professor Danjon, director of Paris Observatory, that that um, flares on the sun may influence the speed of rotation of the Earth, and there were sudden changes. We generally don't like to know that we are traveling on a accident-prone planet. Hey, folks. This is some of the relevant portions of Albert Einstein's foreword for Charles Hapgood's book about how the Earth's crust displaces how it shifts. Um, you can find the book online. You can read the foreword at some point if you'd like to. What we're going to talk about here is the critical jump from where catastrophism was in the past to what we actually know now. Obviously, Einstein was not the only person who discussed this. He wasn't the first. They have been talking about the crust displacing and the earth turning over since biblical times. Uh, but as science really kind of developed over the past couple hundred years, scientists had more and more begun to talk about the cyclical deluge, um, the earth turning over, whether it's Cuvier, Walker, DeLuc, uh, Leibniz, Hibben, uh, Obviously, Major White, Chan Thomas was talking about it as well. When we got to Einstein's time, he was one of a few individuals who actually did the math and said, okay, if you could actually unlock the crust from the mantle, which is kind of a weird thing to begin with, uh, in theory, the crust should be acting like plywood on top of a lake and floating and banging into each other. But it doesn't do that. And that's because there is a thermo electric equilibrium, a plasticity, almost like you put a piece of saran wrap right on top of a piece of saran wrap. You could peel it off, but you couldn't, you know, grab a side and drag it off. They would, there, there's too much friction there to actually do that. That's the same kind of plasticity friction, latching, locking that we have between the crust and the mantle. And so Einstein was just one of a few who did the math and said, okay, if you could unlock the crust from the mantle, we have all of this ice weight at the poles. And because, and this is basic physics here, when you have something that is spinning, the greatest amount of mass distribution wants to spin at the point of greatest centrifugal force, which would be the equator of the spin. I uh, even talks about that briefly in the forward. But they couldn't figure out how to unlock the crust from the mantle. This was Einstein's big problem. Even though he and everybody else who was looking at it at that time said, yes, it's very clear that the earth does this. Nobody could figure out how you unlock the crust from the mantle. There's a problem. They never looked anywhere outside of the earth. They looked at massive earthquakes. They looked at volcanoes. They looked at changes in the rate of spin. They looked at piling and piling so much ice that the weight just wanted to unlock the crust. Couldn't make the math work. Fast forward to today, and we know a lot more about how Earth interacts with space, specifically space weather. And what we know is that even in modern day, moderate geomagnetic storms, there is electric current that is induced not only in the atmosphere, not only in the crust, but all the way down into the mantle. And if that is the case, obviously the low velocity zone, which is what they call the area where the crust and the mantle meet, that is included as well, especially because it has high conductivity. So what happens in the greatest of solar blasts, a super flare or the solar micronova? We get a phenomenal amount of induced electricity going through the atmosphere, the crust, the mantle, and that low velocity zone. And remember, it is a thermoelectric equilibrium. Now, when you surge that much electricity through the low velocity zone, it does two things. 
it disrupts the electromagnetic state of the zone. Remember, it's a thermoelectric plasticity, friction locking the crust to the mantle. And so the electrical aspect gets disrupted, but also you cannot surge electricity through something like that and not have resistance driven heating. And so that's the thermal part of it, thermoelectric equilibrium. This solar micronova that happens every 12,000 years and to a certain extent, it's even possible in what they say could be something like an X1000 super flare on the 6,000 year cycle. That could easily put enough energy through that layer where the crust and the mantle meet to actually unlock it. And once you unlock it, it is simply a matter of the greatest weight distribution wanting to spin at the point of greatest centrifugal force. Before Einstein and all the way up to Einstein and all the way up until what we talked about the other day, Charles Hapgood sabotaging intentionally the entire field of catastrophism. Nobody questioned the idea that this is actually what happened. It's just that they couldn't figure out how. Now with modern space weather science and what we are learning about Nova astronomy, what we are learning about major cycles of the earth and sun, we can now actually put the pieces together and we know that there is actually a very simple way to get to that point. And that is simply by taking the most extreme version of what they say the sun can do and applying it to that circumstance that is related to what Einstein was studying, what Walker was studying, what Chan Thomas was studying, Hibben, Deloop, Cuvier, Leibniz, and the earth turns over. See you in the morning for The Daily Show. Be safe, everyone.